Okay, I don't care how operator you are, how tactically cool you may be in whatever branch or service you're in, you know, be a SEAL or SAS, whatever you want to be. This group of people are probably one of the coolest out there, I would say, that don't get enough appreciation. These are the kind of people that walk into environments where your skin would almost melt off to do what they need to do, whether it be in humanitarian response, war response. These are the guys that, or girls, that are going into the nastiest environments you can ever think of when it comes to nuclear, chemical, biological, or any sort of really nasty environments that a normal combat force or military force is not going to go into. If you've seen the movie um resident evil or even watched you know played the games or watched the series or the law of resident evil you've heard of the stars team right i think it's special tactics and something squad i'm not sure i can't remember what stars is but they were the team that went in if things went really wrong it was like spooky weird stuff going on and you know nasty environments these are like stars to me you know they're not sort of the high tier you know special operators that uh, bust down doors and take names and kick ass these are the ones that go in and deal with the stuff that's freaky freaky right like the weird stuff that's going on and when people ask me like you know matt if there was a zombie invasion and you as a reservist was called up would you be the first one at the tip of the spear to deal with it and well maybe but the reality is these are the kind of people that be involved right dealing with contamination and quarantine and decontamination of people these are the guys that go in and i think they're super underappreciated so i want to look at this video and go through it with you today because they're going to talk a little bit about how they operate this is actually the u.s marine corps special sort of cbrn unit and the u.s armies as well and they're doing a bit of a collaboration you'll notice a lot of the footage that you're seeing here is them of actually sort of dealing with a disaster response so they're doing a lot of construction and sort of uh, you know demolition so to speak to be able to rescue and help people because a lot of the situations that we really are going to get exposed in in the cbrn world like biological especially nuclear is when there's some sort of disaster right chernobyl clear example of course um that's the extreme but we also had as they mentioned in this video the uh the japanese nuclear power plant that had failures there there's a marine um you know deterrence force that went there and did their job to help secure and decontaminate etc that area these are the kind of people that are kind of the unspoken heroes in my eyes, because if there was something horrible that was happening, whether it be, you know, in your local town or city, when it comes to the really nasty stuff that's going on, uh, that could be, you know, in some regard, terrorist related or sort of combat related, especially in today's climate, these are the ones that go in there. And we're talking about, you know, exposing just a single tiny piece of skin, which by the way, this individual has a little bit of tiny bit of skin exposed. Um, but the reality is, is that they're going into the disgusting environments that I would be terrified to go into. Um, and training aside, you know, we put our gas masks on, we do our basic skills and warfare training when it comes to nuclear, biological and chemical attack. But as mentioned in this video, it gets pretty intense. And if they were to deploy, it's, it's go time. So the mission of CBRF is to activate subordinate to a joint task force in support of either the national capital region or civil support. What that means is if there is something that happens like a weapon of mass destruction in the national capital region, we're able to respond and support our army and air force counterparts. Or if there's some type of natural disaster that occurs within the United States or OCONUS, um, we are able to activate under that joint task force and respond as well. There's certain types of situations, they can be either man-made or natural. Uh, we responded uh, in the past to the nuclear power plant incident in Fukushima. Okay, so imagine dealing with that situation, right? You're actually potentially going to be exposed to nuclear radiation just in a disaster relief effort. The, the military is being pulled in there, not just civilian contractors, you know, not just the teams that come from uh, the corporate entity, you know, the business entity. The military is being utilized. Uh, and if you were told, hey, by the way, next week, um, you're going to train and practice for this nuclear, biological, chemical warfare attack. And then the very next day, it's like, no, you're actually now going into it. You could be exposed to radiation. You could potentially not have children anymore or have cancer or whatever else could happen. These are the guys stepping into that. I'm sure many of you have seen the show Chernobyl. Um, it's an HBO show. You know, it's a pretty good show, actually. I really enjoyed it. But it was terrifying to watch. And, and that sort of silent killer of radiation. And these are the guys that are going to do that extreme. Because there's no one else that's going to do it, right? We talk about heroism. We talk about, you know, saving lives and things like that in, in combat, right? You know, pulling people out of trenches, taking grenades, etc. 
In terms of heroism for these guys, it's literally supporting and saving lives in some of the most disgusting conditions that human humanity can ever be exposed to. And they're willing to do that. They're willing to step into that environment to help. Um, of course, you know, no one wants to say, yeah, I'm going to literally kill myself to try and save, you know, thousands of people. But these are the kinds of people that would do it. And I think that takes a little bit different of a sense of, you know, guts and passion and pride in your job. You know, when you go into a combat scenario, you're inherently going to be put at risk, knowing you could at any time be shot or killed by someone. But these guys going into environments that they know are literally going to kill them potentially if they go in there, that's a different type of, you know, that's not a unseen target that pops his head over a bush and shoots you and then runs away like Afghanistan. This is like, no, there's radiation in that area and it will expose to you and you will potentially absorb <laughs> the chemical compound or the radiation or whatever else that's in this zone. Hats off to these people. I think it's incredible that they're willing to commit themselves to doing this kind of work. Uh, all the way to a tornado disaster uh, in our local area. CBRF has two incident response forces. One is always on the active. The incident response force that is on the active has 24 hours to respond uh, in the DC area and uh, bring a reconnaissance, uh, decontamination, and rescue operations on. I'm bringing my rescue team out here and we're conducting joint operations downrange with our Army counterparts uh, in a joint environment. Uh, which is a little bit different from what we normally do things. A lot, a lot of the times at Seabird, if we do things in a bubble, um, but being able to come out to Fort Hood, Texas and work at Mount Town in uh, Fort Hood allows us the flexibility to see things from a different scope. You'll notice these guys are rigged up with some very different mop gear that we tend to see or we're used to. Um, you know, their equipment is a lot more heavy duty. You're seeing the larger rubber seals around the hoods. This isn't just the charcoal suits that are being worn by primary uh, troops on the ground the grunts so to speak this is specialized troops they have the headsets even themselves you know they're not getting uh the standard grunt isn't going to get a helmet of this kind right they need a dedicated communication because speaking uh through respirators is never a good time and communicating through radios through a respirator is never a good time so these guys need really good accurate communication it doesn't look like they're fully rigged up with the radios to have that in sort of intercom between one another but you know when you're working in environments with say you know, collapsed buildings and such you can't be shouting. Your respirator's not going to be able to hear you. So these guys have been given some pretty upscaled gear than what standard troops that go into a CBRN environment are going to get. And rightly so. You know, the U.S. Marine Corps and the Army here seem to have uh, pretty robust equipment or PPE that they're going to be giving to these troops, and rightly so. It's, uh, it's kind of cool to see the difference between the standard field soldier and these sort of specialized units. What that allows us to do is break off from our normal mission set and equipment sets and work with our interagency counterparts to better home our skills uh, so that when we are called for that big bang and uh, that big moment in time when things go bad, that we're able to work together and do it from experience. You can see the sort of scenario they're playing in the background. This is sort of mass decontamination and uh, it, it looks terrifying, right? We watch in the movies uh, all these different scenarios. You know, one of my favorite movies is Outbreak. I think it's the one with the little monkey that escapes and turns a whole city or a little town to like goop uh, with this sort of virus. But this this could happen, folks. We've just come pretty much out of COVID. Uh, regardless of what you think of COVID, it was pretty gnarly overall. And, um, you know, this sort of procedure is really sort of for more intensive viruses or decontamination. But if you're involved in this, imagine going through one of these stations. I have been through one of these kind of stations in a training scenario as a, you know, just a ground troop for the British Army and sort of dry training. Um, not the same kind of unit that you're seeing here, more just a field station uh, that has sort of a dedicated set of troops that decontaminate you. Not as specialized as these guys, but they literally, you're like cattle and they don't mess around. Like they're not there to be your friend. You're literally thrown in there, washed down, thrown to the next guy, strip of your gear. They don't mess around. There's so many troops they've got to get through in the time period. They're given like a, a time of which the troops must be decontaminated by. And if they don't achieve it, they failed their mission, right? So the troops goal here is to decontaminate what seems to be sort of a civilian populace or dummies in this state, in this stance. But in a combat scenario, you know, these guys aren't really going to be so much to say going into that environment. I don't think these are more of a specialized, dedicated unit for sort of civilian populace or for, as they mentioned, sort of uh, federal government areas. You know, the Capitol, they're going to be probably going to the Capitol building and decontaminating those high ranking officials and senior government executives, etc., whatever it may be. Whereas the field force, the you know, the, the decontamination kitchen is a little bit more 
uh, I would say streamlined for mass amounts, whereas these guys are more specialized, I would say anyway. But it's 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 kind of freaky when you go through, in all honesty. It feels kind of weir- weird and surreal, even though you're training. And they don't mess around, right? They, they literally, though, grab you by the arm, throw you to the next guy, spray you down, cover you in soap, you know, tell you to take your gear off, and you, you push through within like five or six minutes, and it's like, wow, what just happened? Um, but this is this is kind of cool to see and how they operate. And let's hope to God we never see this actually happen firsthand with some extreme levels of decontamination because there's obviously going to be some serious fatalities or serious injuries regardless of how quick or, or you know, slow you're decontaminated. We are here learning how to operate within that joint task force and integrating into their units. So it's a lot of meeting our counterparts in the Army. It's a lot of figuring out how we would support that joint task force. I think a lot of people think CBRF is the main mission, and sometimes that's not the case. We are a standalone unit and we can operate that way, but I think in a joint environment, it's far more effective if we operate like we are today, where our recon element is with the Army's RNS section, where... So you kind of notice that you said the recon, right? So these are the guys that are gonna go in first. They may not be the long-term solution, to the decontamination or to the rescue efforts, but they're the first boots on the ground in a scenario. So testing of what's there, um, you know, maybe primarily supporting or rescuing the most prime candidates. So, you know, say the president, chief of staff, um, you know, the senior cabinet members of whatever part of the government they're going for, they're going to want to get them first, right? So the recon element that's going to go into that designated zone, they're going to dedicate towards resources that are most important. They're not going to go for the postman that fell over in, you know, down the street. They're going for those specific scenarios where the recon element of these guys zone in on what is the mission, focus on that mission, everything else will come later. It's kind of cool to see that that's, it's also scary and terrifying to see that they could ignore a large amount of populace initially uh, at no fault of their own because their mission is to support, you know, the more specific uh, scenarios, which I would say in this scenario is, you know, like I said, government officials, things like that. That's what these guys are going to go for. There are decon element is with Army's mass casualty decon and our rescue platoon is operating side by side with their USAR platoon. It's easy to go down range and always tackle the problem sets with your own equipment, uh, your own SOPs and training goals. But when you come down and you work with other agencies, and organizations, you're forced to kind of mold yourself to their way of doing things and their equipment sets, and it helps you work out of the box and do things a little bit differently. Operationally, we are prepared. Um, you can take any one of my PFCs or Lance Corporals and tell them to execute a mission, they're going to do it. I think there's an aspect that's difficult to train for, and that's actually responding to an emergency. Uh, there's the, the, the real situation that we're mentioning here is training is training, right? You know, you... you give up a little bit of uh, leeway here and there. I don't have to put that strap too tight and I don't have to make sure this hood lip is right over my cheek. I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, unmasking drill or going for a piss or, you know, taking a dump or whatever else like that. In a real scenario, everything is is life and death. It doesn't matter what you do. Every single thing is out there to kill you, whether it be, you know, a chemical, an agent, the rubble or material these guys are kind of working on right now, right? Some of this is some heavy equipment and working around in this kind of PPE doesn't make things very easy, right? Respirators, it's harder to work in. If you've ever put a respirator on or done any physical activity with respirators on, it is not a fun time, okay? These suits cook you internally. It is so hot, especially on a hot day. Uh, if you're in these environments and if you're on a cold day, you don't get to wear tons of puffy jackets and warm, comfy gear underneath because it can actually affect the way in which these suits and the, the you know contamination process work. So you could be extremely hot or pretty cold because you may not have the opportunity to remove or add layers if it gets cold or hot, which is also terrifying. And when it becomes really cold, the respirators can also be affected by condensation, ice buildup, etc., etc. So, you know, Again, training environment, so be it. That's eh, pretty easy, not too bad, you know. But anything can go wrong when you're in some of the gnarly environments, say, you know, nerve agents, so to speak, uh, or again, radiation. That's that's truly a testament to these guys. And uh, once again, hats off to them. Um, we can do it in training. We can convoy. We can enter buildings with no contamination. But if we are actually called to respond, I think there's something that it's difficult to train for. What is it like to go into a 10 kiloton nuke? How do I tell my family that I'm going to do that? Um, we do tactical decision games. We do battle drills. We do readiness um, constantly with the Marines to make sure that they're ready to actually activate. 
I think mission execution wise, we're solid. Um, and it's a continuing process of making sure they are literally ready to deploy at a moment's notice. So there you go. Hats off to the Marine Corps and the US Army in this video. Um, I, I always like to take a little different approach to how I review things on my channel. And I think this is something that doesn't get enough spotlight, uh, especially in today's society where we're seeing, uh, you know, the Ukrainian conflict, things like that conventional combat uh, but the reality is at any moment around the world this kind of stuff can happen as i mentioned whether it be you know on purpose from a combat scenario or from you know natural disasters or man-made disasters um, it's it's kind of scary and i'm glad there's people out there today that have the the pride the passion and the courage to take on such a delicate and strategically scary task um, of handling these kind of environments and supporting people who could be really really hurt or could be hurt in these environments so hats off to this marine corps group uh, and of course the u.s army and anyone else out there who's involved with dealing with cbrn at the extreme level um, if there ever goes a time when you do have to deploy and go into something really really nasty well Again, my thoughts are with you, and thanks again for what you do. If you enjoyed today's video, folks, and want to hear more about these kind of content uh, reviews, you know, just looking at different tactics and scenarios, let me know in the comment section below. Also, please hit that little like thumb button. It really helps the algorithm and me and my channel. Um, and if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, click that little bell by the subscribe button. You can also check out the link box below for all my Patreon and PayPal um, financial contributions. Thank you to everyone who's been supporting me. I cannot thank you enough. Of course, I also have my clothing brand sponsorship that I am sponsored by. Really cool company that have artillery themed clothing, uh, flags, decals, patches, things like that. Go check them out. Websites below www.attireforeffect.com. Really cool brand there. Uh, and thanks again for joining me, folks. Have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye bye.